Good morning again, and welcome to CCT Live, the Cape Cod Times Facebook Live news broadcast. I'm Patrick Cassidy, news editor at the Cape Cod Times, and I'm joined today by Kristen Young, who covers the towns of Dennis and Yarmouth and their shared regional school district, uh, which we'll talk about during our segment on the uh, big story today. First, we'll talk about other stories that reporters and photographers at the Cape Cod Times have covered this week. After the big story, we'll take a look ahead at a, a story coming up uh, actually tomorrow, I think. And you can look back at past episodes on our Facebook account and follow us on all our social media, Twitter, Instagram, and the like. Plenty to talk about, so let's get right to it. Kristen, you've been reporting on a story out of Dennis that has to do with uh, kind of an, an unusual practice within the state, if you will, but one that's been uh, really a tradition in Dennis, um, and that's driving on the flats uh, off Crow's Pasture. What, what's going on here? What's, the, what's been the, the, the rub here as far as uh, the stories that you've been working on? So there is um, some big news related to that issue, um, I think, that may have taken some people by surprise. Dennis Selectman added an agenda item onto their Tuesday meeting sort of at the last minute on Monday and decided to pull a, um, a permit, an application for a permit that they had had for a new beach management plan at Croge Pasture that would have potentially um, – seen a, a ban on flats driving, um, although the plan itself that was proposed did not include a ban on flats driving. Three state agencies had come back to the town and said, um, this is something we don't allow anymore, and recommended that it not be allowed under the new management plan. Um, there had been a significant amount of pushback from residents and from ORV drivers who said, you know, we've done this for decades. It's, it's really a community atmosphere out there. It's a family atmosphere. Um, we don't believe anything we're doing is harming the flats in any way. We, we take good care of the beach, um, and we want to continue doing this. Uh, so Selectman said, hey, let's, let's put a, a pause on, on moving forward with the new permit. Let's take some time to collect more public feedback, which I think is what they really want to do. And um, eventually they do plan to file a new notice of intent with the Conservation Commission and with the Department of um, Environmental Protection for another beach management plan, but they want that to be more informed by public comment than maybe the, the, the previous uh, attempt to, to adopt a new plan had been. And again, this is something that's been going on for decades, really, and is unusual. Uh, a lot of people know about, you know, driving on the beaches, Nauset, mm -hmm. and up in uh, the National Seashore, there are areas where you can drive out on the beaches with, with permits. Um, but this is really going on out on the, the flats, so it's beyond just the beach part. It's where the tide goes out, and you have, in that particular area, you have uh, basically oyster beds and, and mm -hmm. things, and that's become very popular in a growing business there in the industry. Um, so the oyster shell fishermen drive out with their trucks, but then you have people who are just driving out recreationally like they would do on the beaches. And uh, it was a little bit self-inflicted, you could say, because they had come to the state with this plan that you, you, you talked about, um, and then the state had come back and said, okay, but – you're, you shouldn't be driving on the flats, period, right? I mean, that was that was how it started. Yeah, there was a lot of um, question from, you know, at public comment from people in the town who said, why are we trying to get a new plan adopted? Why are we trying to permit a new plan when our existing plan, which allows for flats driving, is working totally fine? Um, the director of natural resources, Karen Johnson, had said, well, our existing plan is really outdated. It was filed in 1999, which was years before the state had adopted these guidelines that say no driving at all on tidal flats, um, with the exception occasionally of those um, aquaculture grant holders that you mentioned. Um, but, but Johnson also said, you know, that this plan that we have currently doesn't allow us any flexibility for moving cars based on changing beach conditions like erosion. It sort of has fixed parking areas that may not be working so well for the town now. Um, they wanted to sort of address that issue along with the issue of piping plovers, which have really kind of come to the forefront over the last few years, and there are new regulations around that. Um, the town had wanted to put in place an escort program that would allow shell fishermen to drive out to their grant areas even when plovers were present. That's not something that's consi that's part of the current plan, although I think they kind of made it happen on an emergency basis. They wanted to kind of more thoroughly vet that and, and include it as part of the new plan, and that's why she said the town had moved forward with the proposed changes. And those escort ideas are ones that have come up in other towns, again, with the beach driving, but the difference here is, again, that they're driving out on the tidal flats. And I'm going to go completely out of order, as I already have in the, this story list. So your first time on, Kristen, and I'm uh, throwing a curveball at you. But just to keep with the um, 
uh, kind of driving on the beaches motif. Uh, in uh, Chatham and Orleans, there's been a dust up at this point about uh, driving on the beaches uh, south of Nauset Beach. Um, and this is the uh, most recent in, in a couple of uh, dust ups, one that was uh, probably appropriately labeled the spit spat between East Ham and Orleans about uh, driving and who controls the Nauset spit that, for anybody who doesn't know the area, goes north from Nauset Beach and, and ends at Nauset Inlet, which is kind of the exit of Town Cove up there off Nauset and, and south of East Ham. And that sand was migrating. There was discussion there between East Ham and uh, Orleans about who who owned the tip of the, the spit, if you will. Um, now uh, Chatham and Orleans are, are talking about uh, who is responsible for patrolling uh, an area where people can drive south of Nauset Beach. Have you ever been out to Nauset Beach in a truck? or? I on have, a, yeah. yeah. It's it was lovely experience, right? Great experience. You know, a lot of um, people look to that experience sort of when they're trying to escape some of the crowds in the summer at other beaches, and, and people who do it really have a passion for it. They get their stickers, and they like to get out there bright and early. And Much like in Dennis at Crow's mm -hmm. Pasture, this is that version uh, over there on the, the Atlantic side with uh, Orleans and Chatham and East Ham. But to get to the Chatham area, you have to go through Orleans, and the selectmen in both those towns have been talking about, uh, to a certain extent, how they've not been talking about uh, this issue. Uh, essentially, Orleans was looking to Chatham and suggesting that Chatham had to take more responsibility for patrolling that area. The piping plovers you mentioned, other activities, obviously people speeding on the, on the beaches, which sometimes is an issue, um, or being in areas where they're not supposed to, that's what they're looking for. Uh, Chatham, meanwhile, said, well, you collect all the revenue for, for stickers to get out there. You know, if we're going to be patrolling and it's our land further south towards Chatham, then we should be collecting some of that revenue. And this week it came to a, a bit of a head at, at the Chatham uh, Selectman's meeting. I think they were talking about it, um, and they were essentially saying, well, we should we should get some of that revenue. We should make it 50-50. Um, and, of course, that's something that Orleans is going to uh, balk at because you, you have to drive through Orleans. They're patrolling a lot of the beaches at this point, and Chatham doesn't have uh, people out there patrolling. Orleans, meanwhile, has said, Orleans selectmen have said, we even have problems when we go out there and we try and enforce the regulations, and it's people who aren't from our town, people who may be from Chatham, and they may not pay attention to us because we're not their natural resources folks. Um, there's been discussion about a surcharge on the sticker of, uh, for non-residents of $65 uh, for the sticker to get out there. Uh, Chatham's suggestion that would help pay for their portion of the patrolling. And Orleans has said, well, that's not really fair because we're charging all non-residents for this, but it's really Chatham's uh, job to patrol this and, and we're having uh, other non-residents pay for that. So it's really become a sticking point, even to the point where these two selectmen are pointing at each other and saying, we've been trying to communicate with you and you haven't been communicating with us. And it's one of those situations that always is interesting when you're reporting on it, and Doug Frazier is doing this reporting, uh, where you feel like almost a go-between when you're, when you're writing the story because the selectmen or the groups, whoever they are, aren't communicating with each other. Uh, there's been uh, now a, a draft proposal for how to deal with this, and it's being sent, shuttled back and forth between the two uh, selectmen, so we'll have to see how that goes. But another dispute over beaches, and I suppose we're on Cape Cod, and that's going to happen. You're going to have disputes mm -hmm. over beaches and tidal flats, as, as we've seen. So we'll have to see how that one plays out. Um, Another uh, issue that came up this week, uh, based on some reporting from uh, Cindy McCormick, um, were these new rules for uh, state wildlife areas uh, in the state, uh, but on Cape Cod it has to do uh, with areas like um, the uh, East Sandwich Game Farm, Francis Crane uh, Wildlife Management Area, and the Hyannis Ponds Wildlife Management Area, to name a few. And these are areas that are controlled by the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. And these new rules have to do with dogs. Um, do, uh, have you ever been out to any of these areas with your dogs? I think we were talking about this yesterday, uh, yeah, and you said you I, had. Um, you know, we uh, we used to live in Sandwich, and um, you know, a trip to the to the game farm there was pretty much a weekly, if not more frequent, event for us. And our our dogs' ashes are actually scattered out at the game farm. She used to love her her weekly romps there through the woods and and into the waters in that area, and. Um, you know, we'd see lots of other of dog walkers with, with dogs off leash there as well. So. And, and a very popular area for that. Uh, over the years, there's been uh, restrictions put on different areas in terms of having dogs off leash, as you said. Um, certainly, everybody's run into the problem of, of uh, finding 
the leavings of dogs uh, that, that other people haven't picked up, and that's a, a big concern for people because of water quality, just because of the aesthetics of, of going for a walk and seeing that. Um, but for, again, people who go to these areas, and, and uh, I have a dog, and, and we like to take him different places and have him off leash because it gives them the ability to get some exercise and, and uh in most cases, I would say, most people would say, my dog is not a problem, mm -hmm. but people are also concerned about aggressive dogs and, and the interaction uh, those dogs might have with people. So again, these new rules, which were adopted by uh, the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife last month, uh, a March 14th vote, uh, they, the, the board of that uh, agency uh, said they were going to adopt these rules. Uh, aren't in effect yet in terms of uh, what they're requiring. And what they're requiring, to be clear, is that dogs be on a leash, um, even when they're in the water, which is always kind of an interesting concept, especially if you have retrievers. And, and our family grew up with Chesapeake Bay retrievers, and they would go straight for the water and, and spend the whole day there if they could. Um, and I can't imagine kind of holding onto a leash as the dog's swimming out in the water there, um, but also requiring people to pick up after their dogs. I, I don't think anybody could argue with the second part. It makes common sense that if your dog's out there and making a mess that you would be picking up. I think the people who use these areas and, and really are passionate about it because it's a place so passionate that they have their dog's ashes scattered out there, um, it's an area where they, they really feel the dog gets some freedom that they mm -hmm. might not otherwise get. They have a problem with it. Again, you know, most of the people who have dogs who are friendly and sociable, and, and it also is an opportunity for these dogs to socialize with other dogs and people and, and learn how to do that, uh, say that this is taking it a step too far. Um, there's still some, some uh, things that have to happen. Uh, state officials did hold a public hearing on this in February, I think, in the western part of the state, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the new regulations won't go into effect until they're filed with the Secretary of State's office. Seems like paperwork to a certain extent, um, but before that happens, they need to be signed off by the Massachusetts Executive of Office and Energy and Environmental Affairs, which is this big agency that oversees uh, a lot of these other environmental agencies within the state, or, or and by the Executive Office of Administration and Finance. Not sure where the financial aspect comes into this, but I guess they may be collecting fines or things if they find people uh, not uh, playing by the rules here. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Seems like kind of a done deal, and people may want to get prepared for having their dogs on leashes and, and kind of looking after them a little bit more. Uh, all right, the big story, which is, uh, again, a perennial one um, that, that goes back years to a certain extent, uh, but this year was much more acute in terms of what was happening. It has to do with the Dennis Yarmouth Regional School District, which you cover. Tell us what was going on here. What's, what's the latest so you're right. As you mentioned, um, Dennis Yarmouth School District has been struggling for quite a long time, you know, with budgets that um, are sort of more than than what taxpayers would be feasible or, or want to pay. Um, and they've they've kind of been struggling with this balance of how do we provide a, a responsible and an adequate education and still make things reasonable for our taxpayers. Um, this year, in particular, Yarmouth was looking at a 1.6 million dollar override to fund its share of the school budget. Um, last week, actually, Yarmouth officials, Selkman, sort of stepped up to the plate and they did some looking into their budget and they found a way to fund about half of that override amount um, to the tune of about $800,000 by um, finding some savings. They, there were some savings in their enrollment for Cape Tech, which they thought was going to be higher than it actually turned out to be. They found about $376,000 worth of savings there, another $400,000 in debt drop-off, and um, some about $50,000 in property tax growth as well. Um, and uh, officials say, you know, this isn't just to step up to pay for our, you know, half of the override. There actually is an increase in Yarmouth student enrollment um, of about 39 students between over the last fiscal school year. Um, and, you know, uh, Chairman Tracy Post said, these are our students. We want to pay for our students. We're responsible for them. And that's why Yarmouth sort of stepped up to the plate and did some shuffling and, and found some things to help cover the gap. Um, that said, they're still looking at another $800,000 right now that remains unfunded. And, you know, in the context of $1.6 it sounds like we've made some progress. but. Um, last year, they were looking at a, a, an override of about $570,000, and that was narrowly approved. I think it was by 79 votes overall um, that, that taxpayers said, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. I think everyone wants to avoid a situation where they get into an override and it's, it's not approved. Um, that would result in, you know, a bunch of inconvenient and, and sort of contentious things that would have to happen. Um, 
so the school committee is working with administration to, to continue to try to lower the budget, which right now is um, stands at about $60.6 .6 million. That's an increase of about 3.9% over the previous budget year, um, which when you look at the history of, uh, I think, a, a decade past, there hasn't been a budget increase that significant in at least that amount of time, possibly longer. Um, so some of the things that uh, administration and, and school committee members are looking at doing is finding some sort of combination of cuts. Um, they're looking at still social workers are on the table. That was one that had drawn a lot of um, response from the town. Social workers had originally been cut from a previously proposed version of the budget entirely, and, and you know, sort of hundreds of people came out to a school people committee meeting. People freaked out. I mean, they couldn't believe it. Yeah, there was it. no parking at the meeting. People were parked on the lawns. They were jammed into the room, sort of sitting up behind the, the stage and the presentation and, and just really responding and saying, you know, social workers are the backbones of our schools. They do so much to help students. Um, you know, they not only respond when a student's having like, maybe an emotional or a behavioral issue, but they send packages of fo food home with kids who don't have enough food at home. They, they deal with um, sort of connecting families to resources they may need, whether it's counseling or whether it's um, sort of um, social resources, those sorts of things. Uh, and people say they really need to be there to help. And especially kids. at this point in kind of history, people are looking at social workers and they're looking at what's happened in different schools and they wonder if, you know, more social workers are actually what's needed to mm -hmm. take care of, you know, kids who are again experiencing these problems. So I think that resonated not only with obviously the people who are worried about their jobs, but people who were worried about their kids in that mm -hmm. case um, so so again that meeting they were looking at social workers that yep. came off the table a little bit here but is still being looked at yourself. yeah so they, they uh, you know the school committee at the time said well let's keep all six social workers there's currently six social workers in the district let's keep them all in there and see if we can figure something else out um, so now they're looking at possibly cuts that would be a combination of cutting some of the existing social worker positions still keeping some maybe also lowering the number of new social emotional learning teachers that are being added for this year um, and those are really a response to I guess the state has these growing evolving standards around social emotional learning um, that that uh, Director of Pupil Services Maria Lopes says the district really needs to respond to those standards. They're responsible for those standards. These teachers, I guess, would help drop behavioral plans for kids who, who need that sort of help. They would respond sort of on the moment to any behavioral issues that happen. And a lot of people have asked, well, why the magic number three? Why do we need to include three of those for the upcoming school year? And again, the, the idea is to have one at each school. I guess there are three of those teachers currently in place, and they want to add three more so they can have one at each school. Um, one potential solution is people have said, well, you know, you're describing these social emotional learning teachers sort of the, the social workers do a lot of what you're saying what's that the these teachers yeah. do. Um, so what's the difference? And, and I guess administrators and school committee members have said, well, maybe we could look at training some of the existing social workers in the functions that are being proposed for these new teachers um, so we could keep those, those social workers on board. I think at the next school committee meeting, they've talked about sort of what will that look like and that may be presented to the school committee at that time. That'll be on April 9th. And, and again, this is all leading up to town meetings where they have to decide in Yarmouth, uh, they have to decide uh, at this point at least and, and likely in some form on paying more than this two and a half percent uh, limit that's that's put on how much the towns can raise taxes without going to the, the voters and asking them and then that has to be approved at an election as well. And as you mentioned earlier, if that doesn't happen in Yarmouth, you then start this process that could lead to uh, what, what is being is called the Big Tent Meeting, which is when you have to bring both towns together eventually if there's not a compromise that's reached. And we've covered it, yeah, I, I'm going to forget when it last happened, but five years ago or, or maybe five to eight years ago, and it happened, and it was this big, it literally was a big tent in a field to, to house everybody. It was in the summer because it had moved on in the in the process, and it was hot, and people were bothered. But in that situation, uh, it seems like the numbers are somewhat stacked against people who don't want to vote for the override in Yarmouth because you have the voters of Dennis who don't have an override, and therefore you know wouldn't be paying more in in their on their tax bill beyond that two and a half limit. And then you have the voters in Yarmouth who are in support of of paying the override for the schools versus people in Yarmouth who aren't in support of that, and the numbers start to not work for those that last group. Um, uh, which again, if you get to that point, the other thing that happens is uh, if you uh, the town decides that they don't want to you know, put more on the tax bill, 
uh, then they have to go find other services, and it starts to pit, you know, firefighters and police and these other services against the schools, which is always a delicate situation to get into. So, again, that April 9th meeting is the next meeting where the school committee is going to start looking at this again and then go from there, right? Yes, that April 9th meeting, they're going to be looking at what cuts can be made. They're also looking at possibly using some of their funds from their excess and deficiency fund, but the issue there is that, you know, that, that fund isn't necessarily going to be there next year. So if you use those funds to pay for your budget, knowing that, you know, naturally the budget is likely to go up because salaries go up, health insurance costs go up, then you're only putting yourself in the same situation for the following year and, and sort of, you know, it's this rock and hard place situation. Um, the towns are also looking at the, the current regional agreement and sort of the stipulations for funding there. Um, right now the towns use the state's Chapter 70 formula, which relies on student enrollment along with things like um, revenues in the town, growth in the town, those sorts of things to determine how much each town is responsible for paying for schools. Um, and as it stands over the last few years, Yarmouth's number seems to keep going up and up and up while Dennis's uh, either stays the same or in some cases even, you know, their percentage of the responsibility has dropped a little bit. Um, for this year in particular, Yarmouth is looking at paying about $34 million compared to about $16 million in Dennis. Um, and, you know, Yarmouth is kind of saying we can't continue to afford these these increases what can we do to sort of change things um, I think the two towns are talking and looking at some solutions that could maybe um, lessen the burden on Yarmouth uh, possibly one of those is to take about 2.9 million dollars in administrative costs and look at maybe splitting those 50 50 there's a regional agreement subcommittee that's that's working on these talks and you know it would have to pass uh, through both boards of selectmen and through town meeting if any changes to the agreement are made um, you know the Dennis Finance Committee is saying well maybe 2.9 million in administrative costs is, is a little too much I think their concern is a portion of that number um, which is allocated to supplies is actually um, not really very controllable by the district I guess Carol Woodbury has stepped forward and said the superintendent yeah, the superintendent like, yeah. yeah she stepped forward and said you know we can sort of hold these this 2.9 million at um, to not increase for at least a three-year period um, outside of things that may be beyond our control one of the things that the Finance Committee is worried about is, is vendors raising prices that are beyond mm -hmm. that the district's control and that number jumping up so I think I think there's some, you know, uh, hesitancy uh, from the Finance Committee and Dennis to, to support that on, on that for that reason. But there is also support from Dennis, you know, um, uh, Cleon Turner, who's a Dennis Selectman, and he's also the chair of this subcommittee, said, you know, Yarmouth doesn't have a lot to give us financially, but what we all stand to gain is having this school system that neither Join town could system. afford on its own. Well, um, yeah, and that's the, that's the regional school districts, that's kind of the the carrot is that it's it's less expensive the more students you have you can provide more programs and the like it's going to be an ongoing negotiation it sounds like one way or the other mm -hmm. um, and one we'll probably talk about here again I'd encourage anybody who's interested and certainly the B1 Dennis and Yarmouth would fall into that category to follow Kristen's reporting I covered Dennis and Yarmouth for a while and Kristen who just started with Cape Cod Times well now it's been a little while already knows way more about this than I do in all seriousness and, and I would encourage anybody who wants to to, to really follow this along and understand it uh, to, to follow her reporting. So thank you, Kristen, for that. Um, and we're just going to take a, a look ahead here. Uh, uh, tomorrow uh, we're planning to run a story uh, about a change at a uh, local organization, um, and th this is Shea's Youth Basketball Association, um, which was started by Jonah Shea. He was actually uh, injured uh, in a diving accident, paralyzed in a diving accident. Um, I think it was in the Crow's Pasture area, as a, as a matter of fact, um, where he dove into the water and, and uh, became paralyzed. But it, that it was amazing, the story that came out of that, because he went and started Shea's Youth Basketball Association, and it was to provide uh, a, a basketball uh, uh, league, basically, for, for kids who might not have that opportunity. And it really took off and, and has been one of these organizations that people rave about. There was a recent merger with uh, Cape Cod Children Development, and now Jonah Shea, who started this, is uh, stepping down from his leadership role. He's going to stay connected as a, a member of the new board that they've established. We're going to have uh, more about that in tomorrow's paper in a story by Cindy McCormick again. Uh, and I'd encourage everybody to pick that up and go to CapeCodTimes.com for that. Thanks for joining us. Tell your friends. Share the link. Feel free to reach out to uh, us. Uh, Kristen's email, my email, everybody's email is at CapeCodTimes.com. If you have any news tips, we'd be happy to hear that. Uh, we are where the news uh, on Cape Cod starts. Uh, until next week, have a good morning and good luck.